And I guess it will be around verse 5. Verse 5. Genesis chapter 26. And it will be around verse 5. If you might recall, Abraham, he's sojourning in the land of the Philistines. He's sojourning in that location, and God told him that to temporarily reside there. God reassured Isaac that his promise to Abraham, his oath to Abraham, will be confirmed and that he'll make of him a great nation. The Lord specifically told him not to go to Egypt and not to live in the land of the Philistines. So I hope you've been paying attention to what I said. Sojourning, temporarily residing, not permanently living. And Isaac is a great picture of a second generation Christian where there is not as much faithfulness or dedication compared to the first generation Christian. In verse 4, that was God's promise that he gave to Abraham, and that is repeated from Genesis chapter 22. You might recall that. I believe I've explained that in the last Genesis teaching. If I didn't, well, there's a note for you now. Genesis 22, God gave that promise to Abraham after he was willing to sacrifice his only son Isaac. In verse 5, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Remember, I'm going to be explaining each and every word and verse so that you can understand what the verse is saying. People say the Bible is too hard to understand, but that is not true. It's because there is not much careful studying and time with each and every word. That's why we have verse-by-verse -verse Bible study class on Sundays. That's why it's a good chance for you to come so that you can hear it, and then you're going to get a common-sense gist. And what happens is, trust me, give it some time after several months. Once you get that, then as I explain the next verses later on, every word, your mind will automatically interpret itself. So I hope that you're doing that. So interpret the verse yourself as I interpret and see if there's a matching up because you might not know. I could be lying to you, right? You did not come here for private interpretation. You came here so that you can find out what the Bible is really saying to you. So every person, man, woman, and child has an independent mindset to see for themselves. Okay? I'm here to just help you to do that. Now, in verse 5, meaning that at verse 4, remember, that's that oath God gave to Abraham at Genesis 22. So God is giving that oath, reaffirming that oath to Isaac based on, it seems like it's based on the reason Abraham obeyed what I said, my voice. And he also kept the charges that I gave to him. He also kept my commandments. He also kept the statutes that I laid out, and also my laws. So basically, Abraham was a good boy, which is why I give that oath. So there are people who try to use this passage and prove that the Abrahamic covenant, or God's promise to the nation of Israel, is conditional rather than unconditional. That's not true. When God gave the promise to Abraham, it's not based on a condition, it's unconditional. So even if the nation of Israel has sinned against God, God does not permanent, uh, permanently ban them because it's not based on whether they live right or wrong. No, it's an unconditional oath. And God said, no, uh, this is my people, my nation, even if you mess up. But it seems like right here it's based on a condition, right? Well, the thing is, go to Genesis 12. Remember, this promise, as I mentioned to you, is in Genesis chapter 22. If the promise, the oath, is based on Genesis 22, then what about the oath in Genesis 12, right? So let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Then we'll understand the routine here. Notice in verse 2, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Provided that you follow my promises, keep my commandments. No. Now, if you look at the book of First Kings, and then you also look at the Mosaic uh, law, when Moses was giving the commandments and promises to the Jews, 
what you're going to find out is God will give like a uh, provided by and unless you follow my commandments but if you disobey me then this then I'm going to punish you send you judgment and the promises will be invalid so you're going to find that in the other verses but not in here so Genesis 12 it's unconditional then Genesis 22 go over there again Genesis 22 it's not an oath that God gives to Abraham based on his uh, willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac. It's rather more of a confirmation because of what he did to be willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. God confirmed the promise in Genesis 22. If you look at verse 17, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as a sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So this promise is similar to Genesis 12, but because of verse 18, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So the idea is this. Remember, Genesis 26, when God is re-establishing the covenant with Isaac, it's not based on Genesis 12, okay? It's not based on Genesis 12. It's based on Genesis 24. Genesis 24 is simply confirming. It is a confirmation of Genesis 12. Genesis 12 has no confirmation or condition. It is based unconditionally. So this is pretty simple if we look at common sense as well. If we were to take common sense, let's say that there is a landlord and you make a contract and the landlord writes it down puts it in agreement on contract in the word now isn't god's promise based on the word right so it's written down it's a written contract that's mentioned in the bible that god gave to abraham and genesis 12 when he said it if the landlord uh, wrote it down mentioned that uh, you will be the owner of this property I mean, it's written down, it's, uh, and then there's no condition on that one. It's yours, right? Not based on unless uh, you uh, are in a good relationship with me, and then you follow along and everything like that. No, the landlord didn't say that. He just wrote a contract, and that's settled. Yeah. However, aren't there times that you are in a good relationship with someone, or you become good friends, or you give them gifts, or you know, you're a very good person, and then the landlord basically says to you, man, because you're a really good person, I'm going to make sure that you get that property. In other words, that's a confirmation. It's not something that was written down as a contract at the beginning, and it's based on, well, because you misbehave, I'm going to break it. No, that's not the idea there. The idea is, it's because of the good behavior, it makes the person confirm the promise even more. Does that make sense? That's just common sense. And God gave a promise to Abraham, this is your land, this is going to be your people. But because of Abraham's good behavior, it makes God very pleased that he's going to confirm it even more so. And then God is repeating that to Isaac. Why? Basically, if the landlord was to mention to another person about the promise of the property and then he would probably and most likely praise the previous person that he made a contract with. Well, because this person is such a great guy, was in a good relationship with me, that's the reason why I gave that property, right? Not because of a written contract, but more so the landlord's going to recognize the good behavior of the person. What stands out more than any written contract is actually the person's behavior. What's... Uh, there's a saying that pastors mention is that people won't really remember what you say to them, but people remember what you made them feel. Right. That speaks volumes, and it speaks volumes actually as pastoring a church as well. Okay, so now we understand right here that this is an unconditional promise, 
But these two chapters are simply confirmation. That's it. It's just simply confirmation. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis 26. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Oh, oh, red flag, red flag. Okay, he did something wrong. Remember, God said in verse 3, sojourn. He didn't say dwell. Okay, notice Isaac's sin. Now, this is not a big sin. You notice that? This is not a big sin. God, I mean, God did say to stay there. So a second generation Christian would say, well, God told me to do this. But then you get obsessed with it or out of balance with it. Of course, that never happened to any of us, right? <laughs> Notice right here that he broke the covenant and then instead of sojourning, he stayed, he lived there. So there's a um, extreme out of balance. I mean, you are following God's command, sojourn, but you're doing it a little bit heavier. Now, notice that a second generation Christian is very much like uh, us today in a second generation Christian mindset where we may not be as faithful as a first generation Christian. And it's just little things. It's not big things. But let's keep reading on here. So Isaac, he stayed, he lived in the land, the city of the Philistines, Gerar. That's what verse 6 is saying. And then in verse uh, 7, and the men of the place asked him of his wife. So the people, or mainly the men in that area, in the land of the Philistines, they asked Isaac about his wife. Now, look at this. And he said, Isaac said, deja vu, doesn't it remind you? She is my sister. For he feared to say, she is my wife. Isaac responds that she is my sister because he's afraid to say and admit that Rebekah is his wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah. Lest, so in other words, Isaac is saying, because basically, unless they're the men of that area, they're going to kill me so that they can have Rebekah for themselves because she was fair to look upon, because Rebecca is a beautiful woman. Now notice that a second generation Christian also repeats the sin of the father. Right. Now that's, uh, that's a hereditary thing, that's a genetic factor, and that is a historical proven factor as well. So it's very important that you have to keep an eye on yourself. And you got to see, well, am I following the sins of my father? A lot of times, uh, children who are rebellious, they'll get upset at their parents, but they don't realize themselves. They're just mirroring. They're just repeating what their parents are doing. Now, uh, I really hate to do that myself, but I see that more and more as I grow up. So it is very important that you swallow your pride and then you have to keep a red flag, uh, an eye out. Am I repeating the sins of my parents? And if you don't know, just uh, ask your spouse. <laughs> okay, anyways, all right, let's go to Genesis chapter uh, 26 and then verse 8. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, let me move over here, that way people can see what I wrote down here. Uh, when he had been there a long time. So in other words, in verse 8, and it came to pass is usually that metaphorical expression that's always used in the Bible about what happened later on. That's the idea. When Isaac had been there a long time. You see that there? So now you, uh, what happens with sin is... Yeah, you're living in there. You're there for a long time. Now it becomes a habit. You notice that? It's a habit. Now, I don't really have to say second generation Christian. You people feel like that you got a card out of this. Get out of jail free card. No, you can see that even if you are a say person, the first one in your family, you're repeating some things here. You're repeating some things. And this is a very dangerous thing because you have to be worried when you have children yourself. And yeah, you should be worried. I did say that. I'm not comforting you. 
I'm warning you right here. This is very important because if you don't get this right, you, your children will carry a heavier weight. And that evidence is Jacob and Esau when, we, uh, when I continue on. That Abimelech, king of the Philistines, look out, uh, looked out at a window. So it just so happened after a long time, then Abimelech, who's the king of the Philistines, just happened to look outside the window and lo and behold, and saw and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. So he sees, lo and behold, that's the idea of behold, right? It just so happened to be paying attention to this part. Isaac was sporting with Rebecca, his wife. Sporting, the idea is, some people might think that, you know, well, is it playing sports? No, that's not the idea. It's basically an intimate playing. That's the idea, or caressing. That's what sporting means. So Isaac is sporting with his wife. Hence, the king of the Philistines go, oh, so Isaac is lying here. That ain't his sister. <laughs> That's his sister. He wouldn't be doing that with his sister. <laughs> if we go to verse 8 again, we see another problem with Isaac. Here's the idea. Now, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but compared to a first-generation Christian who experienced a life in sin and in iniquity, uh, they're used to sinning and they're used to hiding. But a second-generation Christian who basically repeats the sin of the first-generation Christian, they haven't experienced that lifestyle. They lived a, a haven or a holy environment. So they're not as good as a first-generation Christian, so to speak, in hiding their sin. It becomes very plain. Now, Abraham hid it pretty well. It had to take the Lord to show uh, the Pharaoh and the king of the Philistines Abraham's sin. But Isaac, he couldn't hide it very well. You know why? Because second generation Christians, they're not used to that sinful lifestyle and hiding and sneaking. So it comes out more plainly. If you second generation Christians, yeah, I'm scaring them, all right? If you second generation Christians think, now, you can hide with your sin. Trust me, uh, it, you're not very good at hiding it. Okay. And the first generation can catch it. Yeah. Yep. All right. Now, this speaks volume about Isaac. We see Isaac, a lot of great examples and warnings. You can make a great sermon just on Isaac, a second generation Christian. I've explained a few stuff before in the Genesis study, and I'm giving a lot more today. So basically, he's not careful with his sin. You notice that? Let's continue reading on. Verse 9, And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife. So Abimelech called for Isaac, and then when Isaac was summoned, Abimelech uh, said to him, Behold, so remember that word is always used, basically uh, paying attention to this part. That's what the word is meaning. For sure, she's definitely your wife. She ain't your sister. And how saidest thou? She is my sister. So why in the world would you say, she's my sister? And Isaac said unto him, because I said, lest I die for her. So Isaac responds to Abimelech, because otherwise, unless I'm going to die for her, that's the reason why I lied. If we look at verse 10, And Abimelech said, What is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lion with thy wife. So Abimelech says, What is this thing that you've done to all of us? You've done, a, uh, you've done us great damage and harm. One of our people could have just nonchalantly, could have just lightly have laid with your wife. So lion is that word for past tense, for late. And thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. You, Isaac, would have brought guilt on all of our people, and we would have suffered the consequences with the sin. 11, and Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So Abimelech gave a charge to all of his people, and he said, if there's anyone who will touch the man or the wife, 
so intimately speaking or even physically harmfully speaking because it says man and wife then they're surely they're gonna really certainly uh, be executed verse 12 then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold and the Lord blessed him notice that Isaac he's sowing throughout that land and as he's sowing and uh, planting uh, and growing crops for himself so to speak he received that same year that very same year a hundredfold so a hundred times more that's the idea about hundredfold it's a hundred times more metaphorically speaking a lot and god's blessing is on isaac so that's the promise now we come to some very interesting things about isaac he is certainly a type of christ notice that he sows seed go to matthew chapter 13 and receives fruit okay we're going to go to isaiah 53 and matthew chapter 13 receives hundredfold notice in matthew chapter 13 jesus christ that he is the sower he is the sower sowing seed and then in return as the word of god gets planted a hundredfold comes out Look at Matthew chapter 13. All right, I'm going to move over here now as I uh, come across each and every one of these areas. The Bible points out in the very first verses of the chapter, let's look at uh, his in, uh, interpretation here. We're going to go to verse 18. Hear ye the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth the way that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. Verse 23, but he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some in what? Hundredfold, just like the book of Genesis. See that there? So notice right here that uh, this is actually referring to the fruits that come out. And verse 37, notice the sower is Jesus, the one who's sowing. Verse 37, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the what? Son of man. Go to Isaiah 53, Isaiah chapter 53. Notice that Jesus Christ is likened to that little plant where the seed is placed and then a plant comes out. Verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that uh, we should desire him. Okay, go back to Genesis 26, verse 13. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. So Noah said, Isaac, the man, he wax, the idea is to increase. So he increased in his greatness. And then he just kept going forward. He just kept progressing. That's the idea. And then his greatness just, and the, uh, most likely it's referring to his possession, his crops. It grew so much until he became known as a very great man. So the, the Philistines recognized him. Notice that, again, the typology of Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ increases and waxes great, and then it causes people to recognize his greatness. Go to the book of Luke, chapter uh, 4. Actually, uh, my bad, that will be uh, Luke chapter, I think, 2 or 3. All right, let's go back over there. I think it'll be chapter 2 or 3. Let me confirm real quickly. Yes, it's chapter 2, chapter 2. Notice that Jesus Christ, that he is progressing as the years pass by. He's waxing and increasing in greatness. And then, as a matter of fact, the whole people recognize his greatness, like Isaac was recognized throughout the whole land for his greatness. 
Let's look at Luke chapter 2. <coughs> Notice that the Bible points out at verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and notice, in favor with God and man. See, people are recognizing his greatness. He's increasing. Verse 40, 40, and the child grew like Isaac grew, right? And waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Notice there's no doubt Isaac has so many typologies with Jesus Christ. Go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Notice in verse 14 that Jesus' greatness is spread about through all the land and they recognize him. Luke 4, 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all, through all the region round about. All right, go back to Genesis 26. Genesis 26. I'm not sure if there are other commentators who uh, made such gleanings in Genesis 26, but there's a lot of typologies of Christ I noticed with Isaac. There's a few that people will point out, but they don't cover as much as would do it justice. And I don't even cover it as much as well. I'm just trying what I can. Verse 14, For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds, and great stores, store of servants. So notice that Isaac possessed, he had a, such an increase of flocks, livestock, possession of herds. So flocks and herds, that's the idea of livestock. So sheep, cattle. And he had a huge store, so a storage, that's the idea. He had a huge storage or store or a huge amount of servants who basically ministered to Abraham. And the Philistines envied him. Notice that the people round about that area, the Philistines, they envied Isaac because of his increase in greatness. Notice, go to the book of Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. Remember, Jesus Christ is increasing in greatness, right? As he increased in greatness, who are the people around that land who envied him, right? That's why Jesus was crucified because they wanted him dead out of envy for his greatness, his increase in greatness. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 27. And notice that Pilate recognized why Jesus Christ was delivered to him. It was because of envy. Notice in Matthew chapter 27. And notice what uh, Pilate mentions about, uh, what the word of God mentions about the Pharisees here. Let's see, verse 18. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. All right, go back to Genesis 26. Genesis 26. Out of envy. Envied by um, the residents, I guess. So let's put residents here. Another typology of Jesus Christ that we can read within Isaac's life. Go to Genesis chapter 26 and verse 16, uh, verse 15, excuse me. For all the wells which his father's servants had dig in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. So notice that all the wells that Abraham, Isaac's uh, father, that Abraham's servants digged up during the days of Abraham, his father, because you might recall Abraham also sojourned in Gerar in the Philistines area. What the Philistines did is that they filled it up with earth. So they stopped the wells. They stopped the water supply. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. Notice that the king of the Philistines says to Isaac, Get away from us, go away, because you're greater than us. You're mightier than us. Notice Isaiah 53 again and go to John 1. Go to Isaiah 53 and John 1. Notice that uh, Jesus Christ was not welcomed by the people of the land. He was rejected. Notice that Jesus Christ was not welcomed by the people of the land. He was rejected. Just like Isaac, he came to a foreign land, 
a place that's not his home, home, and the people rejected him. Like Jesus Christ, he came to a foreign land, a place that's not his home, but the people rejected him. Go to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Notice that uh, we rejected Jesus Christ. Go to John chapter 1, verse 11. John 1, 11. He, uh, verse 10, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Go to Genesis 26 again, Genesis 26. So notice he was rejected. Rejected in a foreign land. Okay, I'm just starting to run out of room right here. So uh, I'm just going to put foreign dot, 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 and then uh, we'll see how much we can add here. I'm surprised how much. But um, I'll probably have to erase some parts here. Let's go to Genesis 26 again. Notice in verse 17, And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. So notice that Isaac, thus he departed. He left from there. That's the idea of uh, thence. It's like, the, uh, it's like hence going away with there combined, so to speak. And then he set up his tent. That's the idea about he pitched his tent. He set up his tent in the valley of Gerar. So, that, so in the valley of the Philistine area. And then he lived there. Verse 18, And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. So Isaac started digging up again those wells of water, uh, those wells of water which Abraham's servant had digged during his days when he was alive. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. Because the Philistines uh, stopped the water supply, filled them up with earth after Abraham died. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. So notice that Isaac uh, gave names to the well by the names which Abraham, his father, originally called them. So he's trying to restore what his father did. Look at verse 19. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. Notice that Isaac's servants, they kept digging throughout that whole valley where they lived at, and finally they found a well of springing water. Go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Notice springing water. Only one of the very few would mention it, and that is Jesus, coincidentally, again. There is no doubt Isaac is a type of Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter 4. A well of springing water. There's a song that goes, Drinking at the springs of living water. And the idea is from the book of Isaac. Uh, it's from the book of John, but also, believe it or not, it's from Genesis 26. Okay, John chapter 4. Notice what Jesus describes his water in verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. It's so coincidental, these words, right? These words are so close with each other. There's no doubt Isaac typifies Jesus. Go back to Genesis 26. Genesis chapter 26. And then we'll read verse 20. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. Now, notice right here that the herdmen in Gerar, so those shepherds, those people who took care of the livestock in Gerar, they were fighting, all right? They had strife. They argued with Isaac's uh, herdmen. And they claim, hey, the water belongs to us. So Isaac, hence, called the name of the well Esek, based on the definition because they fought, they argued with him. 
So Isek, yes, it means striving or strife. That's what Isek means. Verse 21, and they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. They digged another well. And then here comes those uh, loving liberals of the land who just persecutes Christians and said, that belongs to us. So they argued with Isaac's people for that well as also. Hence, Isaac gave it the name Sitna. And Sitna means hatred. It means hatred. From what we see here is if Isaac typifies Christ, Christian would match up very well too. Christian, believe it or not, it means Christ follower or uh, it also means little Christ. So Isaac typifies that as well. Notice that Christians, we do get persecuted by this wicked world. And in this world, this is not our home. We are just sojourning here, temporarily residing. And this place, we do get persecuted by the wicked world. We don't rebel. We don't do an outcry. We don't war. In verse 16, all the way through 21, we get persecuted. We instead receive persecution. We don't return harm in return. So that's what we do in this wicked world. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We get persecuted, but we just keep going from place to place, serving God as best that we could. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and then we'll read verse 8. And then I uh, want you to go to Mark chapter... Uh, we'll go to Mark 10 later. We'll go to Mark 10 later. Let's just go to 2 Corinthians 4, and then we'll read... Verse 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Go back to the main text. Notice that this idea continues about the Christian being persecuted and then just going out by faith, trusting God. We don't get upset. We don't do a rebellion or do anarchy or return evil in return. We just trust the Lord because it is of him that the persecution happens. So we'll continue on that picture as we look at the later verses. But first, verse 22, and, re and he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. So Isaac uh, removed himself from that well, Sitna again, that area, digged another well. And in that well, they didn't fight, they didn't argue. And then Isaac settled down and then he called the name of that well Rehoboth. So he was content this time. And he said, for now the Lord hath made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. So Isaac now declares, now finally the Lord uh, gave us a place, gave us a space, gave us a, a living situation, and we're going to be fruitful. We're going to be really blessed. That typifies a Christian as well, under persecution, and then going through persecution. Doesn't this sound like our church? We go through persecution, no place. We go here and there, and finally, we just go out by faith. We just trust God. This is of the Lord. And finally, the Lord has us settled down, puts you in a place where he puts you on top and blesses you, and then you go, now the Lord gives a blessing to us. He's giving us a space, some room now, a break, a breather. That's the Christian life. Even if people don't persecute you, the enemy, Satan, will persecute you. That happens to everybody with trials. It's obvious. Go to Mark 10, Mark chapter 10, and then 2 Corinthians 12. Go to Mark 10. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Christian attitude when the world persecutes us is that we have to realize it is of the Lord. Notice Isaac said, the Lord gave us room. He never said the Philistines left us alone. He said the Lord gave us room. He knows that this is all of God. So then he's trusting God with his trial and persecution. A Christian should do the same thing as well. There's a lot to blame in this liberal, godless, forsaken area that we're at. But we have to realize it is of the Lord. 
We have to think of it that way. That gives you more peace when you go through trials and problems. When persecution happens, remember, it is of the Lord. So just trust him. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. <coughs> Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in what? Persecutions, in distresses for who? Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. It's for Christ. It's of the Lord, we have to realize. Go to Mark 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 29. Doesn't this sound like us? And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and the world to come eternal life. Now notice that Jesus Christ says this, God is in control now. You notice that? That's the wording. God has given you lands. Like Isaac, he may not have a land, but he believed that God currently now has a land for him. It's just with persecution. You go along with it. So the idea is, present tense, God has a land for you. God has a place for you, a blessing. He's holding it right now for you, but it's just with persecution right now. It's just with persecution. And once persecution's over, you get it more in fullness. Isn't that a blessing? Okay, going back. Going back to Genesis 26. So when, we, when the Christians deal with envy in their lives... They have to do several things. Remember, one, you have to realize that it's of the Lord. You have to trust God. It's of God. Two, you have to realize that uh, we cannot rebel. Don't return evil for evil. That is not the Christian thing to do. Also, three, and I think they can read this. Okay, let me know if they can. The third thing is, remember, now God has a blessing. He's holding it. It just comes with persecution, right? That's the idea. When the world envies you, this is the idea that you've got to do. So the Philistines, they envy. That's why they persecuted the Christian, quote-unquote, the Christian Isaac, so to speak. Now, envy is an ugly thing. It's a horrible thing. And we're going to see the consequences of envy from the Philistines in their later statements, which could be a good warning for any of you who go through envy, who struggle with it. But let's keep reading, and then I'll cover that. Verse 23 Oh, verse 22, there's another thing right here that we are to notice. Notice that Isaac named it Rehoboth, right? Rehoboth means space. It means room. Notice that during that whole time, Isaac, who is a type of Christ, had no room. The people gave him no room. And finally, he found room. Go to Luke chapter 2. Luke, cha Luke chapter 2. Jesus Christ, when he came to this world... They gave him no room. Luke chapter 2, another type of Christ. Isn't that amazing? The Lord of glory, the King of glory, should be born in one of the richest castles ever, but born in a smelly stable because there was no room. Isn't that amazing? That's something to think about. Yeah. Verse 7, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. Notice, because there was no room for them in the end. Okay, going back. Going back to Genesis 26. Another typology of Christ. No room in the end. All right, pretty much game over, so I guess I'll just have to leave it there. And then write down whatever I mention. 26, and then we'll read verse uh, 23. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. So now Isaac, he goes up 
from where he found the well Rehoboth to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee. So in verse 23, we know that Beersheba is usually his home terrain. You might recall that Genesis 24, that it was mentioned that way. You might recall that with Abraham when you look at Genesis chapter 21, 22, and the other ch previous chapters. So he goes back home, and then God appears to Isaac at that same night, and then says to him that, uh, hey, I'm your father's God, so I got your back. That's the idea. He's reassuring him. And don't be afraid. For I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. So God said, I'm always going to be with you. Don't worry, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to multiply. I'm going to increase. I'm going to enlarge your offspring. And I'm going to do it because of my servant Abraham's sake for him. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. So Isaac, he builds an altar uh, at that place, Beersheba. He prays to the Lord. That's the idea about calling upon the name of the Lord. It means prayer. So if people tell you some kind of weird, different definition that it means believing or something like that, no, that's not the idea, okay? It means praying. So he prays to God. That's why he's calling upon his name. That's the idea, right? He's calling on God, calling on him. And then he uh, builds his tent. He sets up his tent at that location. And there are Isaac's servants dig day well. So it is in that area from Beersheba up to Rehoboth that his servants are digging a well. Then in verse 26, then Abimelech went to him from Gerar and Ahuzoth, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. Okay, something weird. Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, is visiting Isaac from Gerar now. He's also bringing one of his friends named Ahuzoth and then also his chief captain of his army, Phicol. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away from you. So notice that Isaac says to those Philistines, why are you coming to visit me? Because you hate me. And you already, uh, took, uh, you already sent me away from you. You kicked me out. And the idea is, notice that he's hated by the world and then rejected by the world. We've already seen that. Isaiah 53, he is despised and rejected of men. So he's hated uh, by the world. And then John chapter 1, uh, they sent him away. They kicked him out. Verse 28, And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. So notice that they said here that it's because we saw, we observed that definitely God's hand is on you, that he's with you. And we said, Let there now an oath betwixt us. So now they all say, so let's uh, make a bargain, a covenant between us. That's the idea of betwixt. Even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee. So when we make this covenant between us, even, that's the idea, that's emphasizing. Yes, truly, uh, even, specifically, it's us and you. And allow us, let's make a deal let's make a covenant with you verse 28 is the first thing to notice about envy here okay now there are some red flags that you want to catch now i'm going to draw it in green i don't know how well people can see online so i'll try to do it as bold as i can in green okay green is perfect for the monster envy right <laughs> now with number one there's something to notice here with envy Go to Ecclesiastes 4. Notice that they said in verse uh, 28, we saw. You notice that? We saw. Go to Ecclesiastes 4. Ecclesiastes 4. A red flag here. These envious Philistines went by sight. So because they see something going on with Isaac, it's not because that they're thinking, oh, you know, we approve of him. He's a good guy. No, it's because there's that envy going on. 
So because they're seeing Isaac's greatness, they know they're going to be outrun. So if you can't kick them out, you might as well compromise with them or make a deal with them. You know what I mean? So envy always goes by sight. It's by sight. They saw something Isaac had, and that's the reason why they did it. So if you can't beat them, join them, right? As the saying goes, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Notice that the Bible says that in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse uh, 4. Again, I considered all travail and every right work that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, did you notice something right there? It has to do where there's a nearby neighbor, right? Once there is a nearby neighbor, then what they do is that they envy you. Why? Because they see you. In verse 3, it has to do with seeing. Isaac was their neighbor. Envy starts because you're seeing in a direction you're close by. Hence, it's so important you clean house. You're putting in your direction, your locality, a neighbor called TV. And you think life is like what you see on TV or the internet or the advertisement. That's just evil. So that's a neighbor that's causing you envy. You have to get rid of all of that. And it's by what you see in your locality that causes envy and you cannot be content. All right, another one is James chapter 3, okay? Now, when you turn to James 3, also go to Genesis 26. There's a second factor with envy. A second, at, uh, a second factor with envy is hypocrisy and lying. It's filled with lies and hypocrisy. Go to James 3, and then keep your hand on Genesis 26. I'm going to read Genesis 26, and then also verse 29. Notice the Philistine said, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee. So the Philistines are telling Isaac, uh, don't do us any harm, because we did not touch you. We didn't uh, do physical harm to you. Hence, you see the true intention. They can't beat Isaac, so they join him. See, the true intention is revealed. It's not because they uh, admire him. No, they're afraid of him. All tied to envy, see? And as we have done unto thee nothing but good, so this, these Philistines are saying, we didn't do anything bad to you. We did always good to you and have sent thee away in peace. So we sent you away in peace. You've done no harm. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. So we recognize that you are the one that's blessed by God. So do a covenant with us. Look at this lying tongue. Go to James 3. James 3. That's what envy does. Look at James 3, 14. 3, 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, that's what the Philistines had. They strove with Isaac's people and they had envy. Now, glory not. Oh, wait a minute. Those Philistines were glorifying, crediting Isaac, thou art blessed of the Lord. And that verse saying, don't glory and lie not against the truth. Don't lie. That James 3.14 is talking about those lying Philistines there. We look at uh, verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Yes, there's confusion Notice the statement in Genesis 26 is confusing. We've done nothing unto thee but good. No, you're confused. Yeah. That's what envy does. It warps your mind. Usually when people argue and fight, even amongst Bible believers and in church, the key problem is envy. And you're, you're confused. Your mind is warped and you say things that don't make sense. That's what happens. Look at verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partial, uh, partiality, and what? Without hypocrisy. 
they were filled with hypocrisy when they did that. Okay, go back to Genesis 26. Genesis 26. Notice that envy, what it causes you to do, it causes you to lie, to, uh, you know, uh, to, um, oh my goodness, I just lost my word, but, you know, to like glorify, to give false credit to somebody, you know, flattery, oh my goodness, I just lost my word on that one. Causes you to give flattery, and then it's hypocrisy. Basically, you have a mouth problem, and then you're also very confused. So there is a lot of this issue going on with envy. You want to avoid envy. These are two markers that you want to know, and you want to be careful in the future. It will get you. A verse in Proverbs points out that uh, wrath and anger is so dreadful, but envy stands above those two. Envy is really bad. Let's go back to verse 30. Now notice Isaac as a typical second generation Christian. Notice that the liberals at verse 29 who persecuted the Christian, you know, oh, you know, we've done nothing to you but good, blah, blah, blah. Verse 30, Isaac, and he made them a feast and they did eat and drink. What are you doing? So Isaac, what he does is that he treats the liberal leaders really well and then joins them and then pretends like, yes, I'm in this with you. And then he parties with them. He makes a party with them and they all ate and drank together. Now, a Bible-believing Christian, we're not rebels. And then we'll, uh, when we try to follow along the rules of this world, we do it peaceably. If there's a certain rule, we'll follow that. We'll do a deal. Okay, as long as it doesn't uh, violate doctrine or scripture. But we don't party them. We don't become buddy-buddy. Now, that's a dangerous thing about churches is that they're becoming so buddy-buddy with the world, even the liberals who criticize them, and then make them like they're one of us, and the liberals mistreat you and persecute you. You're, you got Stockholm Syndrome or something. You're a weird person. To your abuser, you treat them well and then you revere them? There's something wrong with your head, Christian. Go to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Why? Because their churches can grow bigger. They can settle down with the world. And you better watch out for that. You better watch out for that. Now, I don't believe that you should be a rebel. And sure, I'm not against people who become a good testimony to the community. Sometimes they'll have to talk to the chief of police or the mayor or something like that. That way they can establish some kind of relationship enough so where, like Abraham did with the Philistines in a, re a relationship and a dealing as much as, hey, we're peaceable people here. That's what we do in street preaching too with the cops, all right? But no, we don't buddy-buddy and do a, throw them a party, okay? No. Go to Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That's what Isaac did. As a second generation Christian, he sat with the scorners, the ones who scorned him and partied with him. That's another problem with the second generation Christian, second generation pastors. A lot of times I'm suspect of these pastors who are so worldly. I think that they never, I think that these Pastors, a lot of them are just second generation Christians who want to be the world. And then when they get asked that and confronted with that, they get upset. Like, oh, you grew in mommy and daddy's home in a Christian environment, right? That's why you never saw what was wrong with, uh, you know, that contemporary music and stuff. So you don't know what that's like. Pastor Gorski caught a few IFB or IFB people that way. And he lived his life the rock style. And he said, you don't, I knew that life. But you second generation saps, mm -hmm. see, you never experienced that, so that's why you're becoming more worldly. People who experience sin and the world, they know what it is. That's why they don't touch it. But Christians who are like Isaac, so clean, they never touched it. They're not good at hiding it because they're just amateurs. They're just innocents dabbling with sin, playing games and thinking it's fun, and they're immersing themselves in the world.
all right? It shows the immaturity of a second generation Christian mindset. It doesn't show that you're growing up or you're maturing. It shows more of your immaturity. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the people and we've learned a lot of things. What an amazing book that reveals your son throughout the verses and also lessons that we Christians can learn and not repeat the sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.